Welcome back everybody. This week we're going to be looking at middle childhood. So this brings us to our unit learning objectives for this week. Uh, remember, these are the things that I want you to be able to do by the time we get to the end of this unit. So if you have any questions, feel free to book an office hour visit. You can go into our Blackboard site and look at the syllabus and helpful links tab. Uh, there'll be a link there that you can click to schedule time during my office hours. What I'll do is once I get that request, I'll add a Google Meet, attach it to that Google Calendar invite, and then we'll use that to meet throughout the semester. So I want you to be able to explain how emotion regulation impacts development and is related to other developmental theories. I want you to be able to, to distinguish between externalizing and internalizing tendencies. I want you to be able to distinguish between self-awareness, self-esteem, and self-efficacy. I want you to be able to explain and identify examples of industry versus inferiority. I want you to explain what was learned by and why the Bobo doll experiment was revolutionary. I want you to be able to describe and provide examples of the different types of aggression. I want you to be able to provide personal examples of internal locus of control, external locus of control, and learned helplessness. And finally, I want you to be able to synthesize the developmental theories learned in the middle childhood developmental phase to holistically explain development of a person in this stage of life. All right, let's So middle childhood covers the range of age of when kids start formal schooling up until the start of puberty. So in middle childhood, we often think about dealing with the industry versus inferiority psychosocial stage. Who was our theorist associated with the psychosocial stages again? If you said Erickson, you're right. Great job. So industry versus inferiority. In this stage, uh, we start learning to either become industrious or we start to feel inferior about ourselves and our abilities. So let's go back and look at some of these Erickson quotes. In all cultures, at this stage, children receive some systematic instruction. So either that's going, in America, that's going to public school, it's going to private school, it could even be homeschool or some sort of homeschool co-op. Uh, during this age, this is when children are starting their systematic instruction. And so the next quote that we're getting ready to read from Erickson is one of my favorites because I think it's super overdramatic. And if you're really paying attention to the words, uh, that Erickson uses, it's, it's kind of fun uh, or funny to listen to, at least I think it is. So the child must forget past hopes and wishes while his exuberant imagination is tamed and harnessed to the laws of impersonal things, even the three R's. So what are the three R's? If you said they are reading, writing, and arithmetic, you're right. I always think it's kind of funny that only one of those actually starts with R. Um, but in, in here, what it's saying is that um, before kids enter formal schooling, they have all these great things they can do. They have the world is open and they can use their imagination. And then school kind of funnels kids in into more practical types of tasks. So reading, writing and arithmetic. So another quote is, he now learns to win recognition by producing things. So if you think about schools or your experiences in elementary, middle and high school, or even college, uh, people earn recognition by doing things or getting good grades and, and things like that. And so uh, during this stage, uh, children start taking notice to this because in, in prior life, they may have not compared themselves to others as much. Uh, but if classrooms are managed a certain way, uh, then people start almost comparing themselves to others uh, in, so that they can win recognition. So if we look at what Belsky has in her book, uh, in this edition of the book, she said that industry versus inferiority is the need to control our impulses and work for what we want to achieve or industry. And so this always kind of makes me think back to one of my kiddos who has ADHD and uh, one year my spouse and I went on a trip and we bought this really cool book 
uh, called Benicula, signed by the author, got a really great deal on it, had a cute fuzzy cover with a cute little bunny on front, and we we're so excited to give it to him. And when we got home uh, and we gave it to him, he just cried. And he's like, Mom, I can't read. Uh, and so uh, he really struggled uh, with it because, because he had ADHD, he had a really hard time just sitting down and focusing on each word at a time. And so we spent a really long amount of time each night um, where we'd just start sitting. I'd have to sit in my lap. I'd have to sometimes just keep my hands on his face um, gently um, and help him make him point to every single word. And eventually he was able to get his reading up and he was really, really proud of himself. But before that, uh, he felt inferior uh, to his peers because he wasn't being able to achieve like everyone else in the grade. And I also think this is really an interesting topic, especially for our people in here who are educators, uh, to really think about the different behaviors that we reinforce um, for people and that we're not only just providing specific praise uh, to the students who are doing well, but even the students who are more challenging or uh, the students who are trying their best, finding ways to offer that specific praise because if we don't, we start seeing that kids start disliking school. Uh, and, and so if we can find ways to keep them connected because we see that by the time that kids get to about the third grade, uh, they start hating school. And they think a lot of that deals with the reading level of textbooks and the different materials. And so if they're struggling in reading, uh, they can start actually hating school uh, and become disenfranchised from it. So then we're also gonna talk about physical development. I think it's interesting because Belsky calls it physical development and then spends a lot of time more on the neural development. So if we look at this, uh, the book starts talking about the cerebral cortex. What is the cerebral cortex? Okay, so if you said it's the outer layer of the brain, you're right. And uh, why do we have folds in our brain? So our cerebral cortex is the different folds and stuff in the outer part of the brain. Why is our brain all folded? Well, let's pretend this is a brain. So if we see here, what do we notice? about the brain when it has these folds. Sorry, I had to find my camera for a minute. When it has these folds in comparison um, to the paper when it didn't. If you said that it's a little bit more compact so that it could fit in a, a smaller space, you're right. If we didn't have, uh, if our cerebral cortex didn't have all these different folds and things and kind of crinkled up, uh, we'd look very, very different. Or if, if it didn't have that, we wouldn't have as much brain power that we have. Uh, so myelination keeps occurring in our brain and it goes up into the mid 20s ish. Uh, everyone's brain myelinates at different rates, uh, but the myelination really uh, isn't finished in the frontal lobes, which is the area that is related to emotional regulation uh, and planning tasks isn't done until the mid-20s. And so if you think about that, uh, if that's not fully myelinated for a lot of people who are in my classes, nobody would ever have any trouble with procrastination or time management or focusing on things, right? So you hopefully you can see the sarcasm here. Uh, yeah, so it's actually pretty typical for students in undergrad uh, to have trouble planning out their time. And because they have trouble planning out their time, they get really anxious with big tasks and being able to break them down. So a lot of times students will procrastinate on some of those tasks because um, they're just nervous about it and they don't think they can do it. They don't know how to break down. And so it's really important for my undergraduates often to learn how to plan tasks or how to rely on other tools so that they can get through whatever they need to do. So that could be using Google Calendar where you're planning events uh, and putting in those notification reminders when you have to do something or setting aside time in your Google Calendar for different projects that you wanna do and making it like a commitment. And so 
Um, as the, myelin, the frontal lobe gets more myelinated, people get better at doing those tasks. And now we're not also we're not talking necessarily about people with ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, but we're talking about typical development at this point. Uh, something that's interesting about ADHD, which our chapter does go over a little bit about, is that uh, it is the, the new name. I say new, but it's been probably ADHD for most of the peoples in this class, uh, most of y'all's life. ADD was a previous name uh, for ADHD. Uh, it's funny because as disorders, uh, we learn more about different disorders, uh, we change their names. One of the previous names for ADHD was also minimal brain dysfunction, which I always find kind of funny. What do you, what's wrong? Uh, well, you have minimal brain dysfunction. Uh, and so people a lot of times will say, well, but I don't have the hyperactivity for the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Well, ADHD presents in different ways. There are several inattention symptoms and then there are several hyperactivity symptoms. Uh, so many times uh, people will have uh, inattention and they don't necessarily have the hyperactivity symptoms so they go undiagnosed so they can be sitting there looking like they're paying attention but their brain is in 20 different tabs you know like our browsers are sometimes and so it's really uh, important that we uh, don't get mixed up and be like I don't have ADHD I have ADD well actually you don't <laughs> you have ADHD ADD is an outdated term and it has been for a very long time I think I was a child when they actually changed it over uh, we also have synaptogenesis going on still if you remember from one of our previous units uh, we broke this word up into two parts so synapto means synapse or the neural synapses. Genesis, if we break that word apart, means the beginning or to create. So if we stick those two meanings together, it's the creation of neural synapses. And so the frontal lobes, uh, like I said, are continuing to myelinate. Uh, Belsky says in the reading that pruning actually doesn't begin in the frontal lobes until about age nine. And so when we get into adolescence, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a couple weeks and we'll have a really cool little TED talk video that we're going to go through uh, that deals with neural development and people being able to see from other people's point of view. So that's going to move us on to cognitive development. What is that again? If you say cognitive development is the way that our thinking changes across the lifespan, you're correct. Great job. So last week we talked a lot about pre-operational thinking and one of the characteristics of pre-operational thinking was the inability to step back and take in multiple pieces of information in at one time. Um, because of the limited capacity of the working memory, um, children have a really hard time with a problem uh, called centering. And so this is where they typically just focus on the most visually striking or the most uh, attention grabbing characteristic of something. And so that's why they have issues with conservation. So when we move into concrete operations, that's when our, these children are able to start decentering so they can focus on multiple things at one time. And so that really helps them with things like conservation tasks, knowing that even if there's a change in appearance, the same amount of mass still exists. So this moves us on to information processing theory. I really like this art on this PowerPoint slide because when we think about information processing theory, we often think of a computer as a metaphor for how our memory works. So information processing theory is the way that humans process information and remember and retrieve things. So the working memory are the things that we're able to keep in the forefront of our mind and manipulate that information. And if we don't encode it into our long-term memory, we lose that information once we stop manipulating it. So if you work through and you rehearse the information, enough, you'll start encoding the information and you'll start storing it in your long-term memory. So long-term memory is the, are the memories that you have that you're able to retrieve. So retrieval within this theory is the ability to 
pull up a memory and bring it to your consciousness. So executive functions, these are things like planning tasks that we talked about, about being able to inhibit some impulses. So we already kind of talked a little bit about that with ADHD in, in the reading that you did. So rehearsal then is just practicing information until you understand it. So uh, for our class, one of the ways that I said is the best ways to rehearse the information is to take those unit learning objectives that we have at the beginning of our PowerPoint and then turn them into a test. And then if you keep practicing and rehearsing, it'll help keep that information uh, or you'll start encoding that information. It'll go into your long-term memory so that you can retrieve it when you come back to the test. And so it'll be really important that we rehearse not just the information from your reading that you're doing each week from the textbook or not just from the lecture, but all the videos and the different activities that they have you do as well. So selective attention is the ability to be able to focus on one aspect and tune out other things. So if you are at a party and you're able to focus on one person and have a conversation with one person while there's other things that are going around. I know this was pre-COVID days, uh, but if, if you're able to just focus your attention, they say that you have selective attention. Selective attention can be a good thing, but it can also be a, a bad thing as well. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. We're gonna watch a little video. All right, we're gonna do that, but first we're gonna do a little memory activity. So uh, get a pencil and a pen nearby and just set it down for a minute. I am gonna read you a list of words off of a sheet of paper and I'm going to read them to you. And then when I'm done and I say go, you're gonna pick up your pen and your pencil and write down as many of the words that you can remember in any order that you want, okay? So once we do that, then I will go over the list and, and, and do a little bit more things. Typically, I'd have you raise your hand if you remember certain things or not. Uh, you guys are at home or wherever your preference is for learning, so we won't be able to do that fun part, but uh, I'm still uh, fully confident that we can make this work online. All right, so are you ready? Okay, so pay attention the best that you can. Try to remember as many of these words that you can. Don't write them down while I'm saying them. I'll read them first, and then when I say go, then you're gonna pick up that, that pencil and write down as many of these that you can remember. All right, all the suspense. All right, let's go. Bed, rest, awake, tired, dream, wake, snooze, blanket, Doze, slumber, snore, nap, peace, yawn, drowsy, go. All right, I think that was enough time. Hopefully you got to write them all down. Uh, so I'm gonna have a few questions for you and y'all can talk about this in the comments of the perusal assignment if you want, uh, cause it's kind of interesting. So how many of you remembered the word bed? So if we were in the face-to-face -face class, I'd have you all raise your hands right now, okay. Then uh, how many of you remember the word drowsy? Okay, so again, if you're in class, I have you raise your hands, y'all look around, um, but I don't have y'all in person. All right, then who remembered the word sleep? Okay, I would have y'all raise your hands, look around the room. What would you say if the word sleep was actually not on the original list. So many of you will have actually put the word sleep even though that was never a word that I had on the list. So I'm trying to get this so you can see all the words. Those are all the words I believe that I had on the list, yep. 
sleep was not on there. And so I like to do this activity in class. Usually it works pretty well. I don't know how it'll translate um, through the interweb, uh, but uh, when I do it, people are amazed. If you had the word sleep on your list, I actually implanted a false memory into your brain. And so our brains do that because our brains want to try to remember as much information as they can. And so we start making associations with different words. So a lot of the words that were on that list were associated with sleep. So our brain automatically starts thinking that we had sleep on the list. So please discuss your experience in the comments with each other. I'm really interested to see what y'all found or did. So this is going to lead us to another little test thing. Y'all are going to be so tired of these. So because of uh, copyright reasons, I can't record the video in this PowerPoint presentation. So what you'll need to do now is to stop and then travel into our Blackboard site and click on the Selective Attention Task Test video and then follow it. When you're done watching it, I want you to come back in here and chat with your peers on how it went. What are your thoughts? Now that I put you all through the ringer a little bit, uh, I have a little video for you to watch on the Memory Olympics. Students usually find this video pretty interesting because they're amazed at what human memories can actually, or him, human memory can actually do. And so in this little video, they talk about chunking and other memory devices uh, that people can use. And, and it's just a fun video to watch. Now that we've made it through information processing theory, we're gonna move on to emotional development of middle childhood. So the book, it takes a lot of time to talk about emotion regulation. And this is just basically the ability to control your emotions. And this becomes really important. It's interesting because Belsky kind of changed her definition of industry versus inferiority. So in this edition of the book, she said it was to control your impulses so that you could accomplish things basically. In previous editions of the book, she used to say it was the ability to control your emotions to be able to be industrious. And so it's just really interesting to think about it. And have you ever had a time where your emotions really impacted your ability to get things done? Go ahead and discuss that in our perusal site. And so we also have uh, different types of tendencies. So uh, Belsky likes to call them personality traits. I don't like that as much. I like to think of them as behaviors rather than necessarily personalities. But we have our externalizing tendencies. These are acting out behaviors. Uh, the uh, people who get really angry and start throwing things are showing externalizing tendencies. Uh, when I worked in a school district, I once had an elementary school child uh, basically completely destroy the counselor's office, D dented file cabinets and things like that. And so those were some extreme externalizing tendencies. And so we had to work through some behavior plans and interventions in order uh, to make it so that, that the kid can learn at school. Because when they're kind of engaging in some of those behaviors, they're not getting the learning done that they need uh, to be successful in school. We also have our internalizing tendencies, and these are when you start taking things out on your inside. So if we're thinking about for the personal self, which one's more dangerous, I would almost argue that internalizing tendencies are more dangerous for an individual person uh, than externalizing tendencies. Because if you, you know, throw a remote, <laughs> you might, or a pillow, you might be able to get some of that angsty anger out of your, your system, whereas if you're internalizing and beating yourself up on the inside, uh, that can cause some significant issues. And so if we're looking at disorders like depression, uh, we know that people tend to have a very negative view of themselves, potentially others, and the world overall. And so if we're looking at these internalizing tendencies, uh, they can sometimes really, really mess people up. Not saying that there's not consequences for externalizing tendencies, because if you have someone who has these major physical lashing out at people, that's gonna harm their interpersonal relationships and could get them in trouble criminally, especially if they're destroying other people's property or assaulting other people and things like that. So it's really important um, that people learn uh, emotional regulation. It's a really hard thing to do uh, because a lot of times 
uh, when we're confronted with a really uncomfortable situation, uh, we start experiencing certain emotions right away. And so it's, you know, learning to kind of take a step back. I, I always usually tell my students, especially if I have them in person, that if you're really angry at me for some reason and you're turning into the Hulk, right, or the She-Hulk, uh, just wait a minute, wait 24 hours till you turn back into Bruce Banner uh, and then email me so we can work it out. So now we're gonna move on talking about the self. And there's three different terms that we see in this chapter that it's really important that we're able to distinguish which, which each of them are individually and how they differ from the other terms. So first up is self-awareness. What is self-awareness? So self-awareness is knowing oneself. So the book talks about having perceptions about your own self, but it can also be uh, you know, your ability to see your strengths and weaknesses, to know who you are, uh, to know your limitations and, and, and things like that. And sometimes people are really self-aware and sometimes they're not. And so uh, it's really important and it's really hard to become self-aware in some ways because sometimes it takes us having to put away our ego a little bit and analyzing the things that are going on in our lives and patterns of our own behavior. Self-esteem then, uh, self-esteem then is the global feeling about that we have about ourselves, uh, or I, I shouldn't say feeling because it's actually a belief, right? So self-esteem is more a belief about if we're globally good or globally bad, uh, and it's not so much knowing ourselves, but it's more what our opinions of ourselves, ourself is overall. Then we also have self-efficacy. Uh, self-efficacy is actually uh, uh, comes from Bandura. So Bandura is our social learning theory. So self-efficacy is the confidence that someone has in their belief to do a particular task. So if you you may have great high self-efficacy to drive a car or tie your shoe, but you may not have really great self-efficacy in launching a space shuttle, right? And so where we get our self-efficacy from uh, is actually multiple places. Well, we get self-efficacy from our previous experiences. We can uh, increase our self-efficacy by looking at someone that we think we're similar to and if they're able to achieve a certain task. And so all these sources of self-efficacy help determine if we have higher or lower self-efficacy. And what we see in the research is that if you have two people that have the same exact skill set, if one has a higher self-efficacy to do the task, they will often outperform the other person even if they have the exact same skill level. And I always think that's really interesting because if you're constantly doubting yourself to, to engage in some sort of large task, you might actually be limiting yourself in ways uh, that if you had a higher belief in your competence of ability to do a particular task, uh, you might not see all those limitations. And so I know like with my master's thesis, I didn't think I could do it. I had a really low self-efficacy and ironically, I ended up doing uh, my thesis and dissertation on a measure that taps self-efficacy. Um, and so I built, I built myself my own little intervention, right? I made uh, these little cards and I wrote out every single step that I thought I had to do uh, to complete my thesis. And then when I did it, I put a big check mark. So right now I'm writing a statistics textbook. And, uh, you know, there's been times where I'm like, what did I get myself into? I'm never going to finish this. And, and I know from the past where I've had those thoughts where I had low self efficacy. And once I was able to build my self efficacy up, I was able to achieve those things. And so I built myself my own little table. And every time I write a thousand words in my textbook, I color it in with a colored pencil. And so what that does is it lets me see my progress in that, okay, well, if I just keep writing and if I keep moving, it will get done one day. And so that helped build my self-efficacy because I'm able to look back, well, if I was able to write that chapter, well, I should be able to write that. And so um, that was a little bit of an intervention I did for myself. Uh, what are some of your own experiences where you doubted your ability to do something? And were you ever able to finish that task or did you just stop because you couldn't? So I'm really interested in learning about your all's different um, experiences with self-efficacy. 
And this brings us to learned helplessness. This will be our next video that you watch. So you'll need to pause me here and then you need to run back over to our Blackboard site and watch this video and then come back. This brings us to locus of control. So locus of control includes whether a person believes that, that they or an external force is in control of what happens in their life. So we have two major types. Uh, you may have a mix of these, uh, to be honest. So let's look through them and then y'all can talk about whether or not you have an internal locus of control or external locus of control and what impact you think that's had on your life. So an internal locus of control, that's where you blame yourself for failure or you credit yourself for successes that you have. So for example, you could be, I studied really hard on my exam, so I got a really great grade on it. Or it could be something negative, like I didn't run enough this week or lift enough weights, so I lost my race. So then on the other end of the spectrum, we have the external locus of control, and that's where you blame others for your failure or uh, credit other people for a success that you have. So this could be, we lost the games because the referees sucked, or I lost the pageant because the pageant was rigged, or it could be uh, you get a really great score on a test or you did something really amazing and you're like, oh, it was just luck. Right. So that's an external force as well. So what we see from research is that people who tend to have an internal locus of control uh, where they believe that they control their own destiny have a lot better outcomes than people with an external locus of control. So if people with an internal locus of control achieve more uh, than people with an external locus of control, in what ways is having an external locus of control protective for people? So ways that it can be protective for people is that you're not constantly blaming yourself for things um, that you find unpleasant in your life. So, and sometimes people just have to do that, right? Uh, in order to protect themselves, to be able to move forward. Uh, but it's really important to try to shift as much uh, away from blaming outside sources for failures or crediting successes to outside uh, entities uh, to have kind of some better outcomes for yourself. And so we do know that we don't always have everything under our control. And, and so it's also important to keep that in mind. A lot of times, sometimes people will blame themselves for things that were out of their control. And that can be really damaging uh, psychologically to individuals as well. So that moves us on to aggression. So proactive aggression from your reading was what? So proactive aggression is uh, being aggressive towards someone so that you can get something. So this would be uh, knocking someone down so you could steal their soccer ball. I won't do it to you, I promise. <laughs> so the proactive aggression is where you actively do something so you can get something that you want. Reactive aggression would be that you are playing uh, soccer and you get side tackled and then you go and push that player down after you get up. Uh, or in other words, say like someone punched you in the face. If you punch them back, that's reactive aggression. You're reacting to um, a, someone else or a, a different circumstance. You're not just trying to be aggressive to get something. And then we have a relational aggression and that's basically where uh, people use relational capital uh, in order to be aggressive toward other people. So if you have seen a situation, maybe you've seen the situation in your own life or experienced it where someone shares a whole text string with people with the, the aim of trying to get the other people to not be friends with other people. Uh, so that would be a type of re relational aggression. Or uh, if, if someone's like, you can't be their friend and my friend, that's actually a type of relational aggression. Or if they're like, uh, we're not going to let so-and-so sit at our lunch table anymore. That's a type of relational aggression as well. Uh, hostile attributional bias. Uh, this is the tendency for some people to believe that um, the world is out to get them. So if you've seen just somebody in a bar or some sort of place 
and they just think the world's out to get them, uh, they're more likely to engage in some of these aggressive behaviors uh, because they think that someone's looking at them wrong. And the person may not be looking at them wrong, but they sure do believe it. And so these people tend to have uh, more aggressive type interactions with other people and constantly getting in fights because that they believe that other people are thinking bad about them. This brings us to pro-social behavior and more. So pro-social behavior, are just sharing and kind acts that people do, and they can be really dramatic things or they can be minor things that people do to make life better for other people. So now we also have two different terms that we're gonna look at. We have empathy and sympathy. Uh, they're closely related. So sometimes students struggle to separate out the two from one another. So empathy is when you feel the emotions uh, for someone else. So if your best friend was crying, um, because they lost their dog uh, and you started crying along with them because you felt really sad for them, that's empathy. This is different from sympathy where uh, you may see that someone, uh, someone might tell you they lost their dog and you don't know them very well and you feel bad that they lost their dog, but you, you, you don't necessarily feel the amount of grief or you don't feel grief along with them. And you may have sympathy for someone and wish them well, um, but you don't actually have the emotional connection to it. So we also have a term called moral disengagement. So moral disengagement is when somebody justifies an action that is not typically of what people would consider high morality um, and or some sort of lapse in judgment. And so this is when people would rationalize this uh, behavior, we'll say undesired behavior for now, but they rationalize it for whatever reason. So they deserved it. Right. And we actually saw uh, we, we're seeing a lot of this right now with different things uh, in society where they like, well, they're bad. So they deserved what I did to them. Um, this would be also the same thing as victim blaming in a way. Uh, and so uh, people try to justify their bad actions um, on someone else for whatever reason. Uh, induction then is a technique that you can use to help uh, to create empathy and, and sympathy in children. Uh, so if somebody did something bad, so pretend like a child stole a teddy bear from their teacher, uh, induction would be sitting the child down and talking, well, how would you feel if your teacher stole a teddy bear from you, right? And, and it, with younger children, this can be really hard, especially if they've not developed theory of mind yet. Uh, but um, if you keep doing it, especially as their brain uh, becomes a little bit more developed, this can be a really helpful technique in helping children develop empathy with others. Now this brings us to shame and guilt. These two terms are often uh, confused as well for students. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put the two terms up here. So shame is typically uh, when people become humiliated from an external source. So they don't necessarily feel bad for what they do, um, but they do feel humiliated that they have done something that other people look down upon. Now, guilt, on the other hand, is feeling sorry for an action that a person has, has done. And so it's really interesting because a lot of times, uh, very, like celebrities get shamed into offering inauthentic, apologies. And so uh, there's definitely difference between shame, I'm sorry that I got caught, than guilt where I'm sorry that I hurt you and I will change my behavior. And so we'll talk about social development real quick. And I actually have another video for you to watch and this can be the last video of the bunch. Uh, so I'm going to have you all watch a little video on the Bobo doll experiment and why it was so revolutionary. I really love this video. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you watch it because there's stuff in here that you're gonna to need to know for the class. And after you're done watching it, come on back here and talk about it with the class. Well, that's all we have for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. I have my references here. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions and I hope you really enjoyed all the content from this week. Thanks.